Tony, for leading us in worship. Will you take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 24. This morning, I want to tag this text, Until He Comes Again. Matthew chapter 24, we're going to read the first 14 verses. I felt the necessity to go ahead and continue in our verse-by-verse journey through the Gospel of Matthew, and we've come to a very important section that I believe will be very practical and helpful for all of us today. Matthew 24, we'll begin our reading at verse 1. I like to read down through verse 14, and then we'll breathe a word of prayer together, okay? Matthew 24, here we go. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Verse 2, and he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because of lawlessness, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Stop right there. Let's pray. Again, we find ourselves, Lord, in need of Grace to preach, grace to listen, grace to obey. And we thank you that you are here with us. We pray now that you would help us to give attention to your word. We ask for light and life from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Would you finish this statement uh, for me? In the meantime, in between time. Some of you have heard that. I was there with my younger brother when these words were actually etched into our minds during the summer. Before my father went to work each day, he would... uh, call my brother and I together, knowing that an idle mind is the devil's workshop, he would, uh, he would say, <laughs> I have to get to work, and 
I'll be home after my last delivery is made. But in the meantime, in between time, then he would give us a list of things. This list often began, stay out of my room. <laughs> no jumping on the beds. Stay off my motorcycle. Feed the dog. Be sure you keep that front door locked. A few other things of which I shall keep in my memory because I don't want to be indicted. <laughs> but then he would always say he, this before he left to me, Marvin, and don't be roughing up your brother. <laughs> we needed that list of expectations as kids. We did. And we need one today as Christians. Here in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Jesus gives us an expectation list, if you will. Or you could call it a preparation list. Here in this chapter, Jesus helps us to know what we should expect and what we are to do in the meantime, in between the time of his first coming and his second coming. Matthew 24 and 25 comprise Jesus' sermon called the Olivet Discourse. It was a sermon that he preached on the Mount of Olives. It is the most extensive treatment of his teaching on the last days. In his own words, Jesus describes what it will be like before he returns at the end of the age. Today, we're going to give our attention to the first 14 verses. How did Jesus view the last days? What did he say would happen on earth when he returns? How should his people live? How should we prepare as we live through this time? Our Lord will teach us today what we should expect and how to persevere in faith until he comes again. Now the section before you neatly breaks down into three clear sections. In verses one and two, it gives us the context, the context or the occasion in which this message comes to us. In verses 4 through 8, Jesus responds to the disciples' questions and explains the signs which will mark the beginning of the birth pangs, which is really not the end, only the beginning. And then in verses 9 through 14, Jesus explains to us the end, what will happen before the end comes. Together, these verses, verses 1 through 14, give us a grand sweep of history. First, the occasion, then the signs, then the end. Then we'll conclude this message with four clear applications for us, okay? Four applications to practice until he comes. First of all, notice with me the occasion, verses 1 through 3. It begins with a very dramatic picture, if you will. Verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away. Stop right there. Now, we know what was going on in chapter 23, right? Jesus had been pronouncing these uh, scathing, scorching, thundercloud judgments of woe upon the scribes and the Pharisees for their blind hypocrisy and for their dead religion. Standing right in the temple, Jesus confronted these religious leaders concerning their hypocrisy. He exposed them right in the temple of God. And the picture is one that we shall never forget. It is a strong and convicting 
rebuke so strong that you could imagine that those leaders probably sat there with their mouths shut and the temple was quiet like a graveyard. His last words, you recall, was, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, like a wilderness, barren. Chapter 24, verse 1, opens now with Jesus walking out of the temple. He's gone. The Lord of the temple has turned his back on their temple because they have misused it. When Jesus walks out, it marks a time when he, as the Lord of glory, would actually now turn from his ministry to the Jews and now they would be judged in a matter of time and the gospel would go to the whole world. I can't help but to think of that picture in the Old Testament. When Solomon had finished constructing the temple and the priest and all of the people were there, the Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 that when they finished the temple, God honored them by coming down, if you will, in a cloud of glory. And it, his presence was so powerful there that the priest could not even go in and minister. But now we see that same king of glory who is robed in a vesture of human clay, that same king now walks out. And you could write on that temple, Ichabod, because the glory had departed. The stone temple is being abandoned, and the error in which the true temple, the church of God, would now be built. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The moment is tense. You can imagine, if you will, how thick the air was, right? The master has just rebuked the leaders of the nation and the leaders of the temple. And now he walks out. And now we pick up the scene, and it makes a little bit more sense now. When his disciples came up to a point of the temple, to point out the temple buildings to him. Now, wait a minute. What is going on here? Well, hopefully you can see now. Mark's gospel tells us that they actually said these words. Teacher, Behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. You're not tracking with me yet. Okay. There's this intense atmosphere where Jesus has just rebuked these leaders. It is quiet. He walks out. The environment is tense. And someone comes along and they want to lighten the mood. The disciples, we know who they were according to uh, Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel. Uh, it was actually Peter, James, John, and An Andrew. They, they try to lighten the mood. They say, well, you know, look, look at the wonderful architecture. Look how beautiful the buildings are. Jesus was not impressed with those buildings. And neither was he impressed with what was going on in them. So, verse 2, he says, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here 
will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Total, epic, complete devastation. He says it's all going to be torn down. This wasn't the first time that the temple had been destroyed in Israel's history. It had happened twice before, and it was rebuilt. But this time, the devastation would be so final, so consummate, that we haven't seen that temple rebuilt for over 2,000 years. Jesus wasn't looking to be cheered up. Now the scene is set for the questions. Verse 3. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples, which were Peter, James, John, and Andrew, according to Mark's gospel, they came up and said to him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? and the end of the age. Now students of the Bible question whether they are asking one question or two questions or three questions. Well, I think grammatically it's very clear that they are asking two questions. When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The when and the what frame the two questions. When will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now Jesus answers them, and he instructs them and us about what to do in the meantime in between time. And so now we come now to verse 4, where we see the beginning of birth pangs. Here in these verses, Jesus addresses the, the signs or the marks that are the beginning of birth pangs. This is not the end, it's just the beginning. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of Birth pangs. Now, some versions translate that last phrase, sorrows. Sorrows, discomforts, if you will. Every woman who has had a, a child knows that birth pangs are the beginning. They're not the end. They are the start of sorrows. Now, there are two things to keep in mind which will help us to understand what Jesus means by what he says, and I'd like you to make note of these two things before we dive into this section. Number one, remember this, that birth pangs are not the birth. Okay? Women who have given birth know that birth pangs are different than the birth. Birth pangs come in stages. They start with those Braxton Hicks, those uh, false contractions. And then uh, there are real contractions that start the labor. And then there's uh, some contractions that are called transition. That's when that pain just comes and they, it seems to just stand up one on top of the other. And then there's that final stage of pushing. And this is when everyone gets out of the room. Okay, this is when everybody leaves except those who could help. Mothers, could I get a witness here? Birth pangs are not the birth. Jesus is saying 
There are some things that will happen on earth at the beginning, but it's not the end. It's only the start. Now, the second thing we must understand is this, that the end of the birth pangs anticipate an arrival. Now, don't misunderstand what I am saying. I am not saying that physical labor always results in the birth of a child. This is not always the case in physical labor. I want to be sensitive to every mother who has had a child who has gone home to be with the Lord early. I, Mary and I have a little girl, Pilar, that we are um, anxious to see in the Lord's timing. But in spiritual matters, in spiritual things, what Jesus wants them and us to understand is this, that the birth pangs are meant to anticipate an arrival. And we will not understand what he means if we don't see it in that light. These troubles, these difficulties, these discomforts are really the start of the beginning of a time when I'm going to come. I'm going to come. And we must anticipate his arrival when we see these things. So what are the signs? Jesus gives us three of them. Three signs. Imposters, wars, natural disasters. Spiritual impostures, social devastation, natural disasters. Let's look at each one of those in turn. First, Jesus tells us that there will be spiritual impostors. Verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Now notice the claim that they make. Notice carefully, Jesus did not say that some will come, but he said that many, many will come who, who not only simply represent him or try to represent him, but they will say, I am the Christ. In other words, they will claim to be the Messiah. They will claim to be the one anointed by God and appointed by God to be the Savior of sinners. Mark and Luke tell us that they will even use the divine name, I am. They claim to be something that only Jesus is. Secondly, they will have an effect, if you'll notice. The effect is that they will mislead Many. Many will follow these false imposters into deception and destruction. We all remember Jim Jones, right? And Jonestown. We all remember David Koresh and Waco, right? We all remember the Reverend Sung Young Moon. We all remember Holly Selassie. And there are many others, many others who come along, make these false claims that they are the Messiah, and they actually lead many people astray. The beginning of birth pangs will be marked by spiritual impostors. Second, social devastation. Verse 6, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will actually be bloodshed and there will be a threat of bloodshed. Some will come to your very door Others you will hear about on the news. 
This is nothing new, right? Wars and rumors of wars have been there since the very beginning of mankind when sin entered the human race and we saw even that Cain killed his brother. But just trace, if you will, human history. Trace it. And you'll see that it's the story of war. But here Jesus points out that, that these birth pangs will be marked by a certain distinction. There will be an ethnic tension and there will be political tension. Nation will rise against nation. That's the Greek word, ethnos. Ethnic groups against ethnic groups. Kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be trade wars and cyber wars and military wars and political wars and major wars and minor skirmishes. It covers the whole gamut. The world will be wearied by war and strife, but that's just the beginning. Just the beginning. The beginning of birth pangs. Number three, natural disasters. Look at the end of verse 7. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Okay? Merely the beginning of birth pangs. Famine often follows war. But in some places it's the byproduct simply of a barren, cursed earth that refuses to produce nourishment to those who live on the planet. Earthquakes are often seen as the voice of God to men. From the very first earthquake at the giving of the law in Exodus chapter 19 to the great earthquake that shook the earth when Jesus was crucified, Jesus said that there will be these disturbances in the physical realm which are nothing but foreshadows, foreshadows of a more extensive disturbance in the realm of nature, making room for the new coming kingdom. Starvation, disturbance, spiritual deception, social devastation, natural destruction, these are all the beginning of birth pangs. They're the start, not the end. Now verse 9, notice it carefully, begins with the word then. And it catapults us into what will take place now at the end of the age or before Jesus comes again. By using, in this short span of verses, Jesus gives us a real sweep of human history. Now, would you make this note somewhere in your Bible? The shift between verses 4 through 6 and verses 9 through 14, or 9 through 12 at least, is very important. In verses 4 through 8, it, the focus is on events that affect the whole world. Uh, false Christs go out into the whole world. Wars, famines, earthquakes broadly affect the whole world. But beginning in verse 9, the focus now is to the disciples. Notice, verse 9, then they will deliver you. Who is the you? In the context, it's the disciples. And the disciples makes it for the entire church. So this now is instruction that focuses on the church. God's people. God's followers. And there are three things that will particularly affect the church. Here they are. Number one, severe persecution. Verse 9, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. 
Where are the church growth gurus at this point? What do the church growth folks have to say about that message? They would say perhaps, well, Jesus just meant that for the disciples. That has nothing to do with God's people today. Yet in many churches, this message is preached. This message of, well, just come and follow Jesus and he'll make you happy and he'll take away all of your problems and you'll never, ever have to suffer again. That is not the message that Jesus preached. Jesus would not be called a seeker-sensitive preacher. Can you imagine him? This is his message from the start. If you follow me, if you serve me, if you come after me, you're going to be delivered over to tribulation. You're going to be killed. You're going to be persecuted. You still want to follow me? This was nothing new. Jesus didn't squeeze in this teaching at the end of his ministry. As a matter of fact, from the very start of his ministry, he was teaching these things. You remember his first sermon? The Sermon on the Mount? In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, listen to what Jesus said. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right at the start of his ministry, he is saying, that if you follow me, there's going to be persecution. And when it comes, don't worry, because it shows that you have the blessing of the Father and my favor upon you. Later on in Matthew chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus made this clear as well. In Matthew 10, verse 17, he says, but beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in the synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my, for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Verse 19. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. Verse 20, for it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. It's very clear. Verse 21, brother will betray brother to death. Father, his child, children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 22, you will be hated by all nations because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be what? This is nothing new. We find this teaching that goes on and on. You can even make a note of Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower, where Jesus said that there will be some who receive the word with joy, but because of tribulation, tribulation or persecution because of the word, they fall away. So write this down and never forget it, dear friends. Basic to following Jesus is suffering and persecution that comes with it. Let me say it again. Basic to following Jesus is knowing that persecution and suffering come with it. So Jesus tells them these things up front, and he tells us up front so that we don't fall away. Back to Matthew 24. Notice he says that they will persecute you because of my name. In other words, they will hate you not 
because of what you do, but because of who you are, because of my name. And true Christians are known by his name. Jesus doesn't want us to be deceived. He wants us to understand that Christianity is not about an easy cakewalk. It's not a glorified picnic. It's not a glorified hayride. It's not a hundred yard dash either. It's a marathon and it's a war all the way through. So, number one, severe persecution. Number two, here's the sign that will particularly affect the church. Surprising defection. Surprising defection. Verse 10. Notice, he says, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Underline the words fall away in your Bible. It's, the, it, it's one word in the Greek. It means to apostatize. Now, some people fall away openly by word. In other words, they come out and they say, I used to believe that Jesus was the Christ. I do not believe that anymore. I used to believe that Jesus was God. I do not believe that anymore. Some fall away by word. Others fall away by deeds. Notice Jesus says that they will betray one another and hate one another. The betrayal is real. And one of the ways that this deviation in love is seen is that people become uncommitted to the local church. All right, so, so listen very carefully here. When people become unaccountable and start floating from church to church, it's one of the ways that they show a, a deviation from love. Where they may not openly deny the truth, but they fall away in love because they're not committed to the church where they can practice the love. They're unaccountable. They're freelancers. They do what they want when they want to. Nobody can question them about it. They don't fall away from the faith in profession, but they do it in deed. And some go so far as betraying the faithful. What they do is they show themselves to be false converts. And Jesus, or John, speaks of it clearly in this way in John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are, that they all are not of us. And so there will be a surprising defection that will take place in the church. So number one, severe persecution. Number two, surprising defection. Number three, false prophets. Verse 11. Verse 11. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. So persecution, apostasy, false prophets. This will be a threat that comes to the church. Remember now, false Christs pose a danger to the world. But false prophets are inside the church. There are many people who claim to be commissioned by God to, to speak the words of God. And in the early church, this was a problem. If you, if you would read carefully the New Testament, you would discover that in almost every single letter, this uh, New Testament addresses the issue of false prophets. 
in almost every letter. These false prophets are a danger where? In the church. In the church. Not in the world. False Christs go to the world. False prophets come in the church. Let me just give you some verses that you can read later. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Titus chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Revelation 2, verse 2. These are just the beginning of birth pangs. All right? Here they are again. Spiritual imposters. Social devastation. Natural disasters, severe persecution, surprising defections, and false prophets. Now, how do we live? How do we respond to these things? What do we do in the meantime and between time? I want to give you four applications from this text that guide us and tell us what we are to do. These things are real, people. These things are real. Even within the life of this church, we've had people come through the membership class, become members of the church, and then within a matter of months depart. And some have gone on to say, well, God's called them to do something somewhere else and speak something somewhere else, fulfilling this very category. This doesn't just happen to churches without sound doctrine. This happens to churches with sound doctrine. So here's what the Lord would have us to do in the meantime, in between time. Are you ready? Number one, watch out. Watch out. Don't be deceived. This is what he tells us in verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. The words see to it is one word in the Greek. It means to, to have sight, to observe, to be discerning, to keep your eyes open. It is not a suggestion. It is a command. It is a present imperative. This is a command to do something and to make it your habitual practice. Jesus actually returns to this very issue in verses 23 through 26 because false preachers, false prophets, false pastors abound. They abound in the church. There will be charlatans who come along and Jesus says, don't be hoodwinked. Don't be fooled. As Christians, we need to understand that false teachers and false prophets nest in the church. In the church. And so we must make it a top priority to avoid deception. How do we do it? All right, I want to give you three practical suggestions. Number one, we must make sure that we are people who love and delight and embrace and seek out and drink in the truth. We must be people who love the truth. And that truth starts in your quiet times. There is no way that you and I can grow in discernment if you only read the Bible once a week. It starts in the morning hour as God fills your soul and helps you to know who he is and to seek after him. And he fills your soul and strengthens your soul and prepares your soul in the morning hour. 
You say, well, Pastor, I'm not a morning person. Well, then read it in the afternoon hour. But the point is, we must get the Word of God daily. And we must love it. We must embrace it. Secondly, the way we can watch out is not only by having daily quiet times, but by watching out for each other in the context of body life. Listen, membership in the local church means that we have each other's back. No amens there? We watch out for one another. If Jim is flirting with a false teacher somewhere, he may not recognize it. And we can say, hey, Jim, do you know about this fella? Let me give you this information. Stay away from him. We watch out for each other. Listen, being deceived means that you don't see it. Therefore, you need others to watch with you. And so in the context of body life, we encourage each other in the truth and we watch out for one another. Let me give you a third way, practically, that we can practice this. We have to watch out for those who teach us the Word of God. In other words, we, we cannot just allow anyone to teach us the Bible. Not everyone who opens the Bible deals honestly with its contents. There is a difference between preaching the Bible and preaching from the Bible. We don't want a pe preacher or a teacher who says, well, I want to start with this text. No, no, don't start there. Start there, continue there, end there, keep your finger on the text, but speak the word of God to us. We don't want to hear much of your opinion. We want God's word. That's the posture of God's people. Bring us the book, pastor. Bring us the book. Many false teachers who have thousands of people sitting in front of them have an open Bible on the pulpit. And the people who are listening to them have open Bibles too. So how is the deception happening? Oh, it's because often we are not Bereans. Do you know what a Berean is? In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, when Paul and Silas traveled to Berea, they went to a synagogue and preached the gospel. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, listen to how these Bereans are described. Verse 11, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. Examining, notice now, the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. When Paul and Silas got up there preaching, they said, now where is that? Chapter and verse. Where is it? That's what we must do as a church. We, we must be careful about those who teach us the word of God and just sound good. We need the book rightly interpreted and rightly applied. Can I get a witness here? Now, I would not be a good pastor if I didn't, at this point, help you to watch out for some people in particular. Whenever there was a threat of false teachers and false preachers in the church, do you know that the apostles name names? You can read it in 1 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 2, 3 John 8. They name names because they wanted the church to know, watch out for these people. I'm going to give you some names of people you need to stay away from. And these are people who don't just 
err in a little thing. But these are big things, things like the gospel, things like the person of God, things like the way of salvation, they err. And if you follow them, they will lead you astray. People like Kenneth Copeland, people like Paula White, people like Creflo Dollar, people like Jesse Duplantis, people like T.D. Jakes, People like Benny Hinn. People like Tony Evans. Who teaches that there's some doctrine called trans dispensationalism, which means that God transports, he says, transports people who have never heard the gospel, who have never heard of Christ, transports them to another uh, dispensation, another time, and applies the criteria of that time to them. Or that if a Hindu or a Muslim or someone of, or a Buddhist who responds to general revelation responds in faith that God will save them although they've never heard the gospel. That is heresy. No one is saved by natural or general revelation. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among by men by which we must be saved. You must hear the gospel. You must come to know Christ in order to be saved. People like Joel Osteen, people like Joyce Myers, people like Rob Bell, people like Andy Stanley, who wants to unhitch the Old Testament from the Bible. Listen, these are heretical errors and teachers who have thousands of people under their ministry and yet if you follow them they will lead you astray. Stay away from them. Now, you said, Pastor, I got some questions. Call me later. Okay, call me later. Email me. I'll get back with you. We'll talk further. Watch out. Don't be deceived. Number two, stay cool. Verse seven, or verse six. You will be hearing of wars, rumors of wars. Notice Jesus' words. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Wars and rumors of wars are frightening. It really is. It's frightening to hear about some country or some war about to break out, but Jesus says, don't see to it that you're not frightened. The word frightened here is a Greek word which means to, to be startled, to, to, to actually to scream, to be seized with emotion. Jesus says, don't let that emotion settle in. Don't, don't allow that emotion to control you. Don't lose your head. We hear about these natural disasters, these epidemics. We hear about apostasy taking place. Jesus says, don't be frightened, stay cool. Why, Jesus? These things must take place. They're of divine necessity. They must take place. It is the design and sovereign will of God that they must take place. Stay cool. Don't freak out. Watch out. Stay cool. Keep your head. Number three, stand firm. Verse 13. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Many are deceived, according to Jesus. 
Many will fall away. The great apostasy will take place according to 2 Thessalonians 2. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will go, grow cold. In other words, people will be traitors and haters. It will take place. But the disciples now are set in contrast. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. You see, there's a word that the Bible uses, and particularly the book of Revelation that uses to describe true believers. And it's the word overcomer. He who overcomes. And who is the one who overcomes? 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Those who are truly saved, those who are truly born again, those who truly believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, they will persevere. God will preserve them and then they will persevere. They will not be defeated by the world's hostilities. They will triumph over them. This really is the doctrine of the perseverance and the preservation of the saints. Why do we persevere? We persevere because God preserves us. How do we know that God is preserving us? Because we persevere. We keep our eyes on Jesus. We don't go back. We put our hand to the plow. We keep pressing on. We keep trusting the Lord. We keep yielding to his word. Perseverance and preservation is like two sides of one coin. On one side is God's side, him keeping us. On the other side is us pressing on for his name's sake. And if I had time, I'd love to develop that further. But just know this. Preservation and perseverance is like a hand in a glove. We are working. And the only reason, reason we are working is because God is working in us. That's it. Now, if a person does not persevere in the faith, in words, and in deeds, it is because they were never a Christian to begin with. Now, listen, this has implications on how we do evangelism. This has implications on how we counsel people. When we are witnessing the people, we must tell them, following Jesus will cost you something. We must tell them, if you follow Jesus, it will cost you everything, but it'll be worth it. And when we're counseling people, and we see some people who start off all excited, on fire, two months later they're gone. We don't just say, well, you know, they're saved. They're just in a little season of their lives. No, we're to just call it what it is. Perhaps they weren't saved. And if they are saved, they will persevere. But we must counsel people properly and not give a false sense of assurance to people who just abandon the faith either in word or in deed. Pastor, they were baptized. Friends, you can be baptized so many times that every tadpole in America knows your name. That doesn't mean you're saved. What are Christians to do? Watch out. Stay cool. Stand firm. Finally, Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Verse 14, Jesus says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. The good news shall be preached to all the nations. 
the good news of his life, of his death, of his resurrection. It shall be preached. He will make sure that it gets preached. From the glory of God in creation to his patience at the fall to his overcoming love and redeeming sinners to himself, that testimony will come to every person represented in a nation in some way or another. His gospel will march on. It started in the days of the apostles. They believed that it was going out to all the world, but it continues with us. We are to preach this gospel. We are not to be distracted. We are not to get caught up in everything else in life to the neglect of the gospel. We are to preach the gospel of God. It is the good news that belongs to him, that started from him, that is created about him. That gospel, that message that is about God, we must preach that message. The gospel of Christ born a descendant of David, under the law, without sin, declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection. That gospel shall be preached. We must preach that gospel. It's a gospel about our salvation. It's about God rescuing sinners from his own wrath. It's about God delivering us from the penalty of sin and the power of sin and the pollution of sin and someday to save us from the very presence of sin. It's that gospel of salvation that we preach. Not a gospel that will leave you the way you are, but one that will conform you to be more and more and more like Christ. This gospel of peace about how Christ has abolished the enmity between a holy God and sinful man by reconciling in his own body man and God through his death. That gospel shall be preached. It's a gospel of grace. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't win it. For by grace are we saved through faith. And that down of ourselves, it is a gift from God. Not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. This gospel, this gospel of God, of grace, of peace, of salvation, this gospel must be and shall be preached. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, the Bible says that God would even send an angel through the mid heavens as he gets closer to the end to preach that gospel. But now we are the human messengers. We are to take that message to our neighbors, to our friends, to our co-workers. We are to tell them that Christ has come. And Jesus said, I have other sheep who are not of this fold, not of the Jewish fold, but I have other sheep of the Gentile fold. And Jesus said, I must bring them also. That they may hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. They must come. Do you long to hear the trumpet sound? Do you long to see the, the sky rolled back like a scroll? Do you long to see Christ in all of his glory descend? You long to see that those who, are, who have gone on and perished, that they are raised, and we who are alive will together meet the Lord <laughs> in the air. Do you long to be where he is, where the word of God tells us that he will wipe away every tear? that he will touch our face, that he will console us with his love. Do you long to see Christ return? Then we must preach the gospel 
and we must persevere. We must watch out, stay cool, stand firm. Preach the gospel. To the unsaved person here, I must ask you a question. This is a question that you must answer. I want to make sure you get it, and so I want to put it in the, in the form of a song. It goes like this. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the morning breaks, eternal, bright, and fair. When the saved of earth are gathered over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder. Will you be there? Hmm. Not if you don't surrender to Jesus. If you stand before Jesus having never repented of your sin, having never placed your whole soul trust in him, you shall be condemned. You must believe the testimony that Christ died for your sin, was buried, raised from the grave. You must trust in his sacrifice for your sin. You must trust in his resurrection. And if you do, and you give him your entire life, you will be saved. You'll be granted entrance into his kingdom. You will, you will be forgiven of your sins. You will experience a heart change called being born again. And you will persevere in the faith. You will never give up no matter if your family or friends turn their backs, you will keep trusting Jesus. A closing word now for the saints. Let us labor for the master, for from the dawn until the setting sun, let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, we will be there. Okay? Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Make sure that you stay cool Stand firm, preach the gospel, don't be deceived, don't be disturbed, don't be discouraged, don't be distracted. We got a work to do. Let's trust the Lord until he comes. Father, thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for preparing us for life. Thank you for giving us clear instruction and thank you for giving us your spirit that will aid us because the flesh gets weary sometimes. But we thank you that greater is he that lives in us than he that is in the world. During this Christmas season, Help us to open our mouths and to tell 
even those who have perhaps have heard it a thousand times. Jesus is the reason for the season. He's real. He lives. He saves. Lord, help us not to be ashamed of the gospel. And we pray that you would use our stammering tongues to bring eternal life to all who would repent and believe. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.